how old is Earth? And we said, well, from a geologic standpoint, we would think that the answer would be C, very old, billions of years. And from a science standpoint, we've got all sorts of data that we've collected, and it all points to that conclusion. We also said that from a religious standpoint, many people would answer as very young, only a few thousand years. In fact, James Usher used the Bible adding up the ages of all the, the main uh, people that show up in the Bible and determined that the earth was 6,000 years old. Uh, well, it was actually kind of a cool technique. I mean, that, that made a lot of sense and uh, was, uh, I think, a good attempt. Now, when we talk about Earth being 4.5 billion years, that's really kind of hard to, to fathom. I mean, you really, you know, honestly don't get a good appreciation for how much time it is, how long that is. In a relative sense, I'm old compared to you. In an absolute sense, somebody that would be in their 80s is really, really old. And yet, geologically, you can't even blink your eye fast enough to represent 80 years. When you're talking billions of years, the time frame gets way different. So we've got to make this mental leap into how we think about uh, periods of time. Geologists tend to think in time as millions of years. That's the short part. And that sounds just astoundingly long in its own right. <coughs> so if we put it more into the perspective of uh, journey, <coughs> and we go from Los Angeles at 4.5 billion to New York today, about 80% of that is what we call the Precambrian. It's old ancient rock, like my place, granites, <coughs> that have been totally reheated, folded, shattered, refolded. They're just so beat up through so much time, so many episodes, that it's really hard to get much geological information out. It isn't until we get to Pittsburgh that we start getting into the a period of time at about oh, the last half billion years that we really started seeing evidence of, of what was happening on Earth. Really configured out very well. And as I get into New York City and kind of stumble across the curb to my destination across the sidewalk, that represents the time we've been around. Not very long, right? kind of puts us in a little different perspective, perhaps, when we look at our existence in geologic time uh, perspective. And yet, as insignificant as that looks, you know, we are the most complex and the most evolved organisms the Earth has ever seen. We are extremely unique. We're the species. And if we look at all the species that have been cataloged so far, and we're cataloging new ones all the time. Uh, but if you look at the ones that we know at this point, approximately 98% of them are extinct. We're a species, so that means our survival chances are about 2%. Hmm. Is it going to happen tomorrow? Mm, well, you know, it could be Ebola, it could be some wacko with a nuclear bomb suitcase, uh, it could be a meteorite, probably not tomorrow. But they're starting to track those, and I think we're safe for, for our lifetime. But you never know. But some place along the line, we're going to go extinct as a species. We've been around for about two and a half million years. The dinosaurs were around for approximately 150 million years. So we've got a long ways to go before we even equal the life 
span of uh, species of dinosaurs. But everything changes. Now, this is where we start kind of really getting into the differences between how you think about things from a science standpoint versus a religion standpoint. And that's kind of where we throw the work on the graph up last. Bishop Usher simply added up the ages of everybody that appeared in the Bible and subtracted that from, from the day. And um, he came up with the uh, idea that this was created at 9 a.m. Monday, October 23rd, 4004 BC. Okay. And that got put into all the Bibles that were being printed in the 1600s as a footnote in the book of. Genesis. Then it says, Bishop Usher figured out that. Everybody at the time saw this and immediately decided it was in the Bible. Uh, that was it. Earth was 6,000 years old. And that became dogma. The fact that Bishop Usher figured it out uh, kind of got lost. <coughs> well, how good a job do you think he did? I really applaud the approach. I think it was pretty clever. But I think I've got two problems with the data that he was using. You know, we can't keep an up-to-date phone book for calendars. Even with computer technology, census reports, and all the stuff we do, people are moving in and out, things are changing. You know, we, don't, we can't even account for everybody here. And it's very doubtful that the people that wrote the Bible were able to account for everybody. Surely there were more people in the world than just these people. So, and how do you account for generational overlap? When, when are, are they, you know, one ends, one begins, or is there kind of overlap between them? How do you account for that? And I don't think that all happened. If you think in terms of uh, historical document, um, I don't think everybody got counted. So that means James Usher came up with a, a, a time span that's way too short. The other thing that catches one's attention that makes the question data is it's a little hard to see, but if you look here, Adam lived for 930 years. Seth lived for 912 years. Well, do you know anybody that old? We know in Pharaonic times, uh, Egyptians tended to live to about 35. That was life expectancy. Ramses the Great lived to 90. He lived essentially three lifetimes for the average population. That's part of why he was so great. He just outlived everybody. In 1900, the life expectancy of a white male in the United States was 48. Today it's between 72 and 78, depending on which study you want to read. So we made great strides. We we're better fed, we've got better medicine, you name it. We're living longer. Yeah, I still don't know anybody that lived to be 930 years. And the trend says, if we're getting longer, these should have been really short. They were at the very beginning. So there's something about what we observe with what's going on with the population versus what's recorded here uh, that doesn't add up. Now, if you remember last time, we kind of put religion at one end of the spectrum and science at the other end of the spectrum. And we said, you know, somewhere in the middle is about where we all pretty much fit. You know, back and forth, kind of depends on the time and circumstances. But, you know, we, we combine both faith and science in our day-to-day -day lives. For instance, I'm driving down the road. There's a car coming at me in the other lane. We're both doing 60 miles an hour. And I have faith that that driver was going to stay in his lane and not hit me. Now, is there any science that that should happen? Have I collected any data 
Do I have any empirical information that's going to tell me he's going to stay in his lane? No. Statistically, I guess you could say, well, 98% of all drivers stay in their lane. You could do a study like that, I guess. But we just kind of take it for faith, take it and believe it, that he's going to stay in his lane and I'll be safe. Otherwise, we'd never get out of the house, would we? If I like it. But what happens if he sideswipes you? He doesn't stay in his lane. And the police come to the accident site and they give him a breathalyzer test and he blows a breathalyzer test twice the uh, amount of alcohol that's allowed for safe driving. Now you've got a piece of, of data and you can say, oh, he was really dumb. He was driving drunk. So now you combine faith and science in the way things have uh, been decided that day. And we do that all the time. And you don't even think about it. I mean, it's just kind of an automatic thing. So uh, when we think in terms of looking at these things, um, we actually practice science all the time. We're doing the scientific method, asking questions, making observations, testing those observations, and making decisions, theories. But we don't think in terms of that. We, you know, we do it so fast and so automatically, we just blur right through it. But basically, the scientific method is just a real fancy way of saying decision making. One of the things that we use when we think in terms of events on Earth is we divide uh, those events into uh, groupings uh, of periods of time when things kind of happen kind of the same thing. Like the appearance of fish was kind of the thing that happened uh, in the uh, uh, Silurian uh, or Division period here into the Devonian. So kind of right in here we see these, these fish showing up. So that kind of helps us establish that time period. We know dinosaurs kind of started here uh, at, toward the end of the Triassic and basically were wiped out here at the end of the Cretaceous. So we look at the fossils, the remains, the preserved remains of this life, and we see this in the rocks, and it helps us group the rocks then into similar uh, units where similar things were going on on Earth. So evolution becomes a key component of understanding how Earth works. The biological aspects of Earth are just as important as the physical rock aspects. And one of the things that we see is every once in a while, there's what we call a big mass extinction. Things just kind of get wiped out. And here you can see um, this is simply uh, the number of species that are uh, uh, on Earth. You can see specific types of animals. The width shows their um, population. You can see these guys really take off up here. The line shows their uh, evolution and their, uh, their time on Earth. Here's where they first show up. Here's where they go extinct. And when you look at this graph, you see right away there seems to be a big mass extinction right here. The number of species really takes a hit right at the end of the Ordovician. There's another one up here kind of toward the end of the Devonian, not a big one. But look what happens here at the end of the Permian. The end of the Permian just gets whacked. In fact, it almost wiped out all life on Earth. It was the big one. And we don't know why. We suspect it may have been a meteorite impact, but we don't have the smoking crater. That's the problem. But here, at the end of the Cretaceous, we see a fairly significant mass extinction. And there we do have the smoking crater. Down in Chicxulub, Mexico, we have 
the uh, evidence of a meteorite impact, and it was this impact that was kind of the death knell for the dinosaurs. They had some problems before this impact, but this impact was the final straw. And that's the end of that species, or those species. So these mass extinctions and these changes in what life forms uh, are in existence help us uh, figure out the rocks and uh, put them in a relative sequence and uh, help define what we call the geological time scale. Okay, here's one of those simple little axioms of life that you've probably never even given much thought to. But it's amazing how this kind of helps you figure things out geologically. The high points, i.e. things like the mountains, are being weathered and eroded. They're breaking down and the materials are being carried away. So the mountains are being reduced. And the basins, the valleys, the ocean basins, the lake basins, are filling with the sediments that are coming from the mountains. So they're being filled in. So the highs are eroding, the lows are filling, and eventually, if this process goes on long enough, we should have a planet with a smooth surface, right? All the highs have been obliterated, all the lows have been filled in. But here we are on Earth, and an Earth that's 4.5 billion years old, and it's anything but smooth. We've got the Himalayas at over 8,000 meters tall, We've got the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean that's over 11,000 meters deep. Huge discrepancies. So there have got to be some agents at work that are reshaping and changing planet Earth. It's not static. It's not just all eroding the highs and filling in the lows. But somehow we're recycling things. We're building new mountains. We're making deeper basins. Things are moving around. Earth, Earth is very dynamic. Everything is always changing. The old geology joke, the only constant is change. You know, it's, just, it's true. You can count on things changing. If I were to put Mount Everest down in the deepest part of the Pacific <coughs> Ocean, this is the Marianas Trench, and it's the Challenger Deep. That's the deepest part of the trench. And I put the base of Mount Everest at that point. I would still have a mile of ocean above the peak of Mount Everest. That is how vast and how deep the oceans can be. And when you think about it, 71% of our globe is covered with ocean. So we've really only fairly thoroughly explored the continents and the, kind of pecked around the <coughs> edges of the continents and the oceans. And it's only been since the Second World War that we've really been able to get a look in the deeper parts of the ocean. And it wasn't until 1962 that we were able to send a submersible into the deepest challenger deep area. And it's only been done one other time by James Cameron a couple of years ago. So there's a lot to discover out there, a lot that we don't know. But what we've learned in the last 60, 70 years is more than we've ever learned before then. So we're making great strides, and things are really changing. New ideas. Okay. So. This is kind of one of the questions I wanted to think about a little bit was, which of these is smoother, a billiard ball or the surface of Earth? How many vote for billiard ball? I, I kind of like it. It looks pretty good to me, doesn't it? Doesn't it look, it's pretty reasonable. How about surface of Earth? Who votes for that? Is there are a bunch of you that aren't going to vote. <laughs> that, way, that way you can't be wrong. Right? <laughs> Well, I mean, looking at the two pictures here, the Himalaya Mountains, or this billiard ball, 
gee, that sounds like kind of a dumb question, doesn't it? Billiard ball, of course. Okay. Is that good science? Am I comparing apples to apples? No. I need to try and figure out a way to compare these two. And just by looking at them and getting this gut feeling, ah, that's not science. That's not. It may give you a first cut as to a possibility, maybe a hypothesis, but it's probably not going to help you get the right answer just by looking at it. So how do you decide? Well, maybe we could observe it, maybe we could take some measurements. Or we could start looking at them dimensionally. So now you've got the problem of, well, how am I going to do this? If I go up to the top of uh, Mount Everest, uh, I can't just drop a tape measure down the side. I mean, it's got to be able to hang straight, right? And just the weight of that much tape measure will stretch it and change the scale. And what do I call the base? And